our Father which art in heaven, reveals a God not only who is a loving Heavenly Father, but He's there in heaven. He's sovereign. He's in control of this universe. He guides what takes place in our lives. He's the God of might, the God of majesty, the God of power. We can approach the all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God of the universe, knowing that our loving Heavenly Father delights when we come to Him in prayer. Not long ago, I saw on the internet a three-year-old boy repeating the Lord's Prayer. Now, that's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. You recall that Christ's disciples came to him, and they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. In the New Testament, the Lord's Prayer is found really in two places. It's found in Luke, the 11th chapter, and it's also found in Matthew, the 6th chapter. Matthew 6 is a longer version of the Lord's Prayer than in Luke chapter 11. The Lord's Prayer might actually be titled the Disciples' Prayer because it was the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We're going to be studying the longer version in Matthew chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to take it and turn to Matthew the 6th chapter. So you're taking your Bibles, looking at Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer phrase by phrase, because this prayer is not only a prayer to be said, but it has to do with a life to be lived. Matthew, the sixth chapter, we're beginning there with verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now Christ's instruction in the Lord's Prayer is so simple that it can be grasped by a little child. But it's so profound that the brightest and greatest minds will never fully understand its depth. Now, the Lord's Prayer is divided into two sections. The first three petitions have to deal with the glory of God. The last three petitions have to deal with the necessities of human beings. That structure of the Lord's Prayer, first dealing with the glory of God, then the needs of humanity, is placed there intentionally by Christ. Here's why. Because when God is given his proper place, everything else falls into place. Can you read that with me from the screen or say it? When God is given his proper place, all other things fall into place. In other words, when God is given his supreme place, his glory and his honor, when they consume our lives, only then can we effectively present our needs to him. So let's begin this prayer and take a look at it phrase by phrase. Our Father, which art in heaven. Here is the key thought. We have a heavenly Father who cares for us immensely. He's anxious to hear our prayers. He's both personal and sovereign. Notice what it says, our Father which art in heaven. It combines two concepts. First, the fatherhood of God as a loving, caring father. And secondly, the sovereignty of God. God's love is always driven by God's power. And God's power is always motivated by God's love. Now, the idea of the fatherhood of God is a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Let me give you some examples of this. Take your Bible, please. Turn to Isaiah chapter 63. Let's take a look at the fatherhood of God. 
and its significance in our personal lives. Isaiah chapter 63. You're looking there at verse 16. Here Isaiah speaks, and he says, Doubtless thou art our father. Without a doubt, God, you are our father. You're the one that cares for us. You're the one that loves us, the one that sustains us. Doubtless you are our father. Abraham may be ignorant of us. He's using an illustration. Verse 16, Isaiah 63. Israel may acknowledge us not, but thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Isaiah says, as we walk through life, never forget that we have a loving, caring, heavenly father. Look at Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. This is a consistent theme through scripture. Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. Pity in the sense of looking down upon with care, compassion. Why is it that this is true? Verse 14, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. When the mountain is high, when the journey is long, God, our loving Heavenly Father, knows that we are weak and frail, and he looks down upon us with compassion. Jesus teaches us to call his Father our Father. God loves us as he loves his son. That is one of the most profound thoughts in the universe, that Jesus invites us to call his father our father. And God loves us as much as he loves his own son. We're not orphans, street children begging for food. We are sons and daughters of God. He is our loving, Heavenly Father, Jesus is so eager to welcome us into the family of God that the very first words he teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer are, Our Father. In Christ, we are one family with a Father who will guide us, a Father who will strengthen us, a Father who will sustain us, a Father who will empower us, a Father who will direct us, a Father who will protect us, a Father who will provide, a, provide for us. And that is incredibly good news. There is a wonderfully encouraging statement in the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 105. And you can notice it here, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, 105. God hears every word that is spoken. That's our Heavenly Father. He's not too busy for us. He listens to every word that is offered, every prayer that's offered. He tastes the sorrows and disappointments of every soul. He regards the treatment that's given to father, mother, sister, friend, and neighbor. In other words, when we feel abused, when we feel mistreated, when we feel condemned, when we feel criticized, our Heavenly Father knows all about that. Next sentence. He cares for our necessities, and His love and mercy and grace are continually flowing to satisfy our need. From heaven's sanctuary above, our loving Heavenly Father pours out grace. He pours out mercy to satisfy every one of our needs. Now, the concept that God is our Heavenly Father impacts our lives greatly. This is not something that's simply theoretical. It's not some intellectual insight but it impacts the way we live day by day in those grim, discouraging, dark moments. We must constantly remind ourselves, and we've got a loving Heavenly Father, that we matter to God. In His infinite mercy, we are of royal lineage, children of the King of Kings. Now the expression, our Father which art in heaven, reveals a God not only who is a loving Heavenly Father, but He's there in heaven. He's sovereign. He's in control of this universe. He guides what takes place in our lives. He's the God of might, the God of majesty, the God of power. We can approach the all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God of the universe, knowing that our loving Heavenly Father delights when we come to Him in prayer. He waits in eager anticipation to answer our prayers and meet our deepest needs. Our Father in heaven, 
that idea places together these two profound concepts that I've mentioned. The love of God and the power of God. The power of God is always motivated by the love of God. And the, and the love of God is always backed by the power of God. We need not fear. Our joy need not be strangled with worry. Our lives need not be filled with anxiety. Our days need not be filled with despair. The one who loves us most has the power to change the most hopeless and discouraging circumstances. There is a statement in the book Prophets and Kings, page 260, that I've read often that has encouraged my life. When the valleys have been dark, when the mountain paths have been high, when the devil's dark clouds of discouragement have flooded over me. This statement in Prophets and Kings has reminded me of my loving Heavenly Father. When in faith we take hold of his strength, what do we do in faith, everybody? What do we do? What do we do? You're not so sure. What do we do in faith? Take hold of what? His strength. He will change wonderfully change the most hopeless and discouraging outlook. He will do this for the glory of his name. When in faith we take hold of what? His strength. He will do what? Change. How will he change it? Most wonderfully change. What will he change? The most hopeless and discouraging outlook. Why does he do that? For the glory of his name. When the valley is dark, when the mountain path is high, you have a loving Heavenly Father, a Father who is the sovereign God, a Father who is all-powerful, a Father who loves you with immense love, and He will take you through that dark valley for the glory of His name. Our Father, which art in heaven. What's the next phrase? Hallowed be your name. Now, what does that mean, hallow it, be your name? The, be, the word hallow is another word for holy. Or it, we could translate it, honor be to your name. Now, in Scripture, a name stands for character. So take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 34. A name stands for character. Exodus, the 34th chapter. We are looking there at verse 5 to 7. When we pray, hallowed be your name, we are saying, God, let me always honor your character. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. Then the Lord and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So when the Lord proclaims his name, what is that significant of? We'll look here at verse 6. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. He's proclaiming his name. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So to, when, when we pray, Lord, I want to hallow your name, the, what we are really praying is in our inmost thoughts, our conscious acts, and our spoken words, we want to reflect his loving character. We plead with God that we'll always honor his name, that we'll never soil his reputation, that we'll never disappoint him by acting contrary to his will. So this idea of hallowing the name of God is living a life which we honor God. Some time ago, I read the story of a young man that was a freshman in college. It was the first time that he was ever away from home. His mother was a maid in a hotel, and she worked making beds and cleaning toilets and cleaning bathrooms, and she saved her money to send her son to college. When he just got to college, one of the first Saturday nights that he was there, he was invited to a party. And as he went to the party, he was enjoying it, and an older student slipped up to him and said, here's something, take this, you'll enjoy the party more. It was illegal drugs. And he looked at it, and uh, the older student said, take it. You are going to enjoy the party much more. 
and the young man was hesitant. He said, I, I, I don't want to take those drugs. And the older student pressed him. He said, you'll enter into a state of ecstasy. You're going to feel so much better. You're going to enter into another world. And the student looked at him and he said this, look, my mother is a maid. She worked in a hotel making, making beds. She cleaned toilets. She saved and saved and saved for me to come to college. I could not possibly put something in my mind that's going to destroy my educational experience and bring dishonor to my mother. I could not dishonor my family's name by taking this. The honor of my family means more to me than taking this substance. God has acknowledged you and me before the heavenly angels. We are children of the heavenly king. We're part of the royal family of the universe. And James says, live worthy of the name for which you are called. If that college student refused those drugs because he did not want to dishonor the name of his mother, are the words of your mouth dishonoring the names of Christ? Is what you watch on television, if you watch it, or the internet dishonoring Christ? Does your life dishonor Jesus? When we say, hallowed be thy name, what we are really saying is, I do always those things that what? Please him. I never want to dishonor Christ's name in the light of God's love. We don't want to let him down by our poor choices. In the light of Christ's sacrifice, we never want to disappoint him by our careless actions. In the light of the Holy Spirit's pleading, we never want to embarrass God by refusing to yield to the moving of the Holy Spirit. I like the way one modern version of the Bible puts it. It's, it's a version I wasn't really too acquainted with. It's called the Christian Standard Version of the Bible. But it, it translates that first expression of the Lord's Prayer this way. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. The idea is as we pray, we admire, we esteem, we honor, we reverence, we treasure, we value God's name above everything else. One Christian theologian, John Piper, put it this way. Nothing is clearer and more unshakable to me than the purpose of the universe is for the hallowing of God's name. His kingdom comes for that. His will is done for that. Humans have bread sustained life for that. Sins are forgiven for that. Temptation is escaped from that. Here's what Piper is saying, and I think he's right. What he's saying is this, that you and I were born into existence in the universe, in the context of the great controversy between good and evil, in the context of the intergalactic struggle between Christ and Satan, in the context of this great controversy, we were born into the universe to honor God's name. We we're born into the universe to, to keep God's reputation before the entire universe as Christians, as holy, and as honored, and as esteemed. So when we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are praying that our lives will always honor God's name that will never, ever disappoint you. Disappoint him. The Lord's prayer begins, God, we value you. We value your name as holy. We acknowledge and value you as infinitely pure, as undefiled, as righteous. You are the supreme and absolute treasure in all the universe and above the universe. All other treasures are, are, are nothing beside you. We can never honor God's name and never really pray that prayer unless our lives reflect our faith. We cannot seriously pray, how be your name, if we're dishonoring God in our lives. The, now, what's the key to honoring his name? It's to recognize that he is gracious, he is loving, caring, all-powerful, and yielding to the, to the moving of his Holy Spirit. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. When we pray, thy kingdom come, the idea is this, that 
and you know, the, the idea of Christ's kingdom is a predominant theme through the New Testament. Take your Bible, turn to John 18, verse 36. We're going to explore this expression, thy kingdom come. John, the 18th chapter, 36 verse. Jesus, in John 18, verse 36, puts it this way. He says, my kingdom is not what? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my, then my servants would fight. So when we pray, let thy kingdom come in the Lord's prayer, we are praying that God would take our minds out of this world and focus them on the eternal kingdom. Look, for example, at Matthew 25, verse 34. We're looking at this concept of the kingdom in the New Testament. Now, Jesus did say the kingdom of God is within you. What did he mean by the kingdom of God is within us? And we pray thy kingdom come. The kingdom of God within us is the reign of Christ in our hearts as King of kings and Lord of lords. That there is nothing else but Jesus on the throne of our hearts. We can never acknowledge his coming kingdom with meaning unless his kingdom first reigns in our hearts. But this prayer, thy kingdom come, is a prayer of the longing of the heart that we long for another world. Matthew, you're looking there at Matthew, the 25th chapter, and no, let your eyes drop down, Matthew 25, and we're looking at the 34th verse. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. Now, remember, Matthew 24 is about the signs of Christ's coming. Matthew 25 are three parables about readiness for Christ's coming. And this is the last of those, second to last of those parables. Verse 34, then the king shall say unto them on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So Christ has a kingdom that he's prepared for us from the foundation of the world. And when we pray thy kingdom come, what we are saying is really this. I pray God that your, your glorious name will be honored as holy among all nations throughout the universe. I long for the day when all the forces of evil and wickedness are banished to the regions of hell and destroyed forever. I long for the day when Revelation 21 verse 4 will be fulfilled, that you'll wipe away all tears from our eyes, that there'll no, be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. The kingdom of God is locked in a cosmic conflict with the transient fleeting kingdoms of this world. And one of our great weapons of warfare is prayer. And as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, God, I pray that your kingdom come. I want your kingdom, not mine. I want your name to be honored, not mine. In this battle for the souls of men and women, I ask you, Father, deploy your troops. Send us out for the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth so your kingdom come. When we pray your kingdom come, what are we praying? We're praying that the interests of God's kingdom are our interests. The upbuilding of his kingdom is our supreme desire. The joys of his kingdom are our delights. Our heartfelt prayer is, Lord, we're sick of this world with its injustice, its suffering, its sickness, its heartache, its famine, its death. We're sick of a world where cancer takes its victims. We're sick of a world where the young die too young. We're sick of a world where bombs drop and innocent children are killed. We're sick of a world of injustice. We're sick of a world of poverty. Lord, your kingdom come. We long for the coming of the kingdom. We long for the fulfillment of Revelation's promise. And if we pray that prayer, it's not only a prayer to pray with our lips, but to live with our lives. Are you living a life, a kingdom life, where your heart longs for the kingdom of God and your life shows that? Thy kingdom come. We pray that prayer of Revelation 11, verse 15. Take your Bible, please. Turn to Revelation 11, verse 15. Our Father, a loving heavenly Father that art in heaven, the sovereign God, hallowed be your name. God, I want to honor you in everything I do, every word, every action, every thought. 
let your kingdom come. Let Revelation 11, verse 15 be fulfilled. Revelation 11, verse 15, here it is. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That is the kingdom that we are looking forward to. That is the kingdom that we pray for. The kingdoms of this world are transitory. Rulers come today and are gone tomorrow. Nations rule today and they're gone tomorrow. But the kingdom of Christ is the eternal, everlasting kingdom. Jesus will reign forever and ever and ever. But here's some incredibly good news. In Daniel chapter 7, you want good news, turn to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel chapter 7. And you're going to look there at Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. Notice what Scripture says in Daniel 7, verse 27. Last part. Let's read it from the screen together. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is to be given to the people of the saints of the highest. Notice the kingdom and dominion, the greatness of the kingdom. Jesus secured the kingdom with his death on the cross of Calvary. In the final judgment, it will be revealed that he is worthy of honor and praise. But at the end, Jesus will grant to you and to me a place in his eternal kingdom. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we are praying, Lord, may I enter into that eternal kingdom where there is no sickness, suffering, heartache, or death. And Lord, may I live the kingdom life. Our prayers reflect the longing of our hearts. They reflect our greatest desire. They reveal our inmost thoughts. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy what? Thy what? Thy what? Thy will be done. Whose will? My will? My will? Not at all. Did you notice in the Lord's Prayer that three pronouns are never used and three pronouns are always used? What pronouns are never used in the Lord's Prayer? My, I, and mine. Never used. But the pronouns our, us, and we are used nine times. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The story is told of an old Scottish woman. She used to travel from home to home across the countryside selling thread and buttons and shoestrings. Now when she came to an unmarked crossroads, it was kind of a fork in the road, she had a stick and she'd throw that stick up in the air and when a stick fell, if it came to the right, oh, I go to the road on the right. Threw the stick up, went to the road on the left, I go to the road on the left. One day a man passed her and she was standing at this crossroads between the right road and the left road, threw the stick up, came down, pointed right. Threw the stick up, came down, pointed right. She kept throwing it up and the guy said, well, why do you keep throwing that stick up? And she said, well, the stick's not pointing the direction I want to go. <laughs> There are some people that pray like that. <laughs> they pray, Lord, uh, did I hear you right, Lord? You want me to go left? And I want to go right, Lord. Lord, I think I'll keep praying until, you, until I find out the way I want to go and you confirm my choice. Some people pray simply to confirm their own choice. How do you know you are praying for God's will? How do you know that you are not seeking your own will in your prayer and asking God to confirm your choice rather than asking him to reveal his choice? Here's one way you can know. We will never really know God's will unless we're willing to give up the thing we want most. See, we are prone to come to God with our desires. And we have something in our mind, we say, that's what God wants. I know God wants this because I feel impressed. But unless I'm willing, honestly, to give up the thing that I want most, I will never know God's will. 
when what God wants is more important than what I want, I'll then be able to discern his will. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane praying? Matthew 26, verse 39. You know it well, the story. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus was facing the cross. He was facing the farce of the trial. He was facing the mockery of Roman soldiers. Jesus was facing the nails through his hands and the crown of thorns upon his head and the blood running down his face. Jesus was facing all that. And in Matthew chapter 26, we look there at verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus goes a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What did he mean when he said, let this cup pass from me? What did he mean then? What was the cup? The cup was the cross. Let this trial, let this difficulty, let the cross pass from me. Because he knew that the agony of the cross would bring him into the depths of darkness, bearing the guilt and shame of sin like he had never been before. He would feel God abandoned because of sin. He would feel God forsaken. So he says, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, the key point here is this. If you say, if you look at Matthew 6 and Luke 11 and compare that with Matthew 26, if you look at the phrase in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, and you compare it with Matthew 26, it's essentially the same. So what we are really praying is this, that as long as we live, we want to live the kingdom life here and now. We want to live a life in which the will of God governs our lives so we walk in the light of his kingdom. You remember what David prayed in Psalm 40, verse 8? Go back to Psalm 40, verse 8. The kingdom life is a life not which we come to God trying to superimpose our will upon God's will, but we come seeking his will. We come delighting to do his will. Why? Because we know that God's will is far better than our will that God's plan for our lives is far better than our plan for our own lives. Psalm 40, you're looking there, verse 8. Reading it together with me, please. I delight to do thy will, O God. Now, does the text say, God, I'm going to do your will if it kills me? Is that what it says? Does it say, I'm going to do your will even if I don't want to do it? I delight to do thy will. There comes a point in the Christian life where... All we want is what he wants, that the Spirit places within our hearts a desire to do God's will. And we can say with the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O God. The prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a prayer that the reign of evil on this earth will be ended, that sin may be forever destroyed, and that the kingdom of righteousness will be forever established. The re but the reign of evil must end in our hearts before it can ever end in the universe. Jesus longs to establish the principles of his eternal kingdom in us so that we'll be fit to live in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Now, here are the first three petitions. What are they? They start out with our Father which art in heaven, revealing to us a loving heavenly Father whose power is behind his love. Then there are three petitions. First, Hallow your name, honor your name. That's what I want to do, Lord. Second, your kingdom come. Uh, Lord, I want to live a life of the kingdom life where I'm longing for the new kingdom and not get settled down in this world. And third, your will be done. The first half of the prayer, Jesus teaches us to regard his name, his kingdom, and his will. He teaches us that his name is to be honored, his kingdom is to be established, and his will is to be performed. That's the first part of the prayer. Now, when we place his glory above everything else, we can ask in confidence. In what? What can we ask in? In confidence that our needs may be supplied. When honoring his name is our priority, 
when longing for his kingdom is our greatest desire, when doing his will is the goal of our lives, we can claim his promise that the riches of heaven are ours by faith. He is the God that will never let us down. He'll meet each of our needs. The first three petitions lead to the last three. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's the next phrase? Give us, give us tomorrow. Give us next week. Lord, I can't see very far in the future, uh, but Lord, I'm, I'm, I want you to, to guide me next year. What's, what is that next one? Give us what? What day? What day? This day, our what? Daily bread. Now, there's something significant, really significant about this phrase that you can easily miss. It's not a request for tomorrow. It's a request for what? Today. We believe that God's going to supply our needs today, just as manna fell each day. So God's blessings come one day at a time. We don't have to fret about the challenges of tomorrow. We don't need to worry over the problems the next day might bring or the stress over tomorrow's needs. You know, there's that hymn, One Day at a Time. You remember that hymn? I would sing it for you, but I'd empty the church. <laughs> One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I'll have to do. Yesterday is gone, sweet Jesus. And tomorrow may never be mine. Help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. The God who rained manna down in the wilderness to meet Israel's needs has not forgotten your needs. The God who sent the ravens to feed Elijah by the brook of Cherith will not pass by one of his faithful self-sacrificing children. The God who multiplied the oil and the meal to feed the widow of Zarephath and her son when, we, when they were down to their last morsel, facing starvation, attempting to eke out a meager existence and simply stay alive at a time of famine has not forgotten you. Now at times in our lives, God allows us to come to a point of desperate need. And he does that for a purpose, so that we can learn lessons of deep trust. Now, we live in a time of abundance today. Very few of us in this room are going to go home and not eat something or for Sabbath lunch today. But when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we are praying that God will meet every one of our needs and that we can trust him implicitly. If we fail to entrust him implicitly today, when the crisis breaks tomorrow, the prayer that we will have to pray in meaning, give us this day our daily bread, will be meaningless. Does the Bible predict in the book of Revelation that there's a time coming when no man can buy or sell? Does the Bible predict that? Is that just uh, a symbolic illusion, or is that real? Is that really coming? If that is really coming, will there be a time that we pray with earnest, give us this day our daily bread? And will we trust God during that time to provide for us? There's a marvelous passage often overlooked in Isaiah 33. So if you have your Bible, take it and turn to Isaiah 33. If not, look at the screen. Isaiah 33, verse 14 to 17, describes the final conflict in the last days of earth's history known as the time of trouble. And it shares with us there the issues that God's people will face when in earnest they have to cry out, give us this day our daily bread. You're looking there at Isaiah 33, we're starting with verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. In other words, the false pretense has been stripped aside. The true kingdom people are revealed at that point with Christ living and reigning in their hearts. Then the question is asked, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who is the devouring fire? You remember in Hebrews it says, our Lord is what? 
a consuming or devouring fire. So this is an allusion to the second coming of Christ. Who shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Then it tells you, verse 15, he that walketh righteously. They're a kingdom person. They've been longing for the coming of Christ. They've been praying the Lord's Prayer with meaning, thy kingdom come. He that walketh righteously, he that speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. In other words, he's not a dishonest person that stops his ears from hearing the blood. In other words, they're not watching all this crime and violence on TV and their characters are being shaped to love violence. Shut us his eyes from seeing evil. Oh God, shut our eyes from seeing evil. Now notice, he shall dwell on high. Who is this that dwells on high? It is the righteous believer whose kingdom the kingdom of God dwells in their hearts. They're praying, give us this day our daily bread. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given to him. His water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty, and they shall behold a land that is far off. When we pray today, give us this day our daily bread, we are praying in faith for that time that we shall walk through the greatest crisis in the history of this world. We're praying by faith and we're saying, God, I trust you. God, I believe that you can supply my needs. When we have needs today, when we're brought into a point of dependence on God today, we are learning to trust him. God gives us little lessons of trust so we can exercise the muscles of faith to learn greater trust. The more we learn to trust today, the more we'll be able to trust in the future when every earthly support is cut off. One of the great lessons God is trying to teach us is absolute, total dependence on him. Give us this day our daily what? Bread. But there's another hidden meaning of that passage. Give us this day our daily bread. You remember in John 6, verse 27, Jesus says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. See, the hidden meaning in give us this day our daily bread is not simply for the physical needs, but we are praying for the soul nourishment. We're praying that the hunger of our soul will be filled by Jesus Christ, the living bread. Just as our stomachs growl for food when we're hungry, our souls growl or long for God until we are fulfilled. This longing for God, this soul hunger, is only satisfied as we kneel in his presence with the word of God opened or we sit there in our favorite chair with the word of God open and let God speak to us as we meditate in quietness upon his word. And as we pray, as the song says, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. So when we pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, we are praying that he will instill within us trust to meet our daily needs. And we're praying that he himself will come as the bread of life and feed us, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, Why'd you put that line in? <laughs> Lord, I wish I could leave that line out, somebody says. Now notice Jesus does not encourage us to pray, forgive us our debts because we forgive our debtors. It's not because. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What's the difference between because and as? As is an attitude. If we have an unforgiving attitude, that blocks us from receiving God's forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. What is the basis of forgiving others? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Coming to Christ on the cross, knowing that we have failed him, knowing that we have disappointed him, knowing that we have let him down, knowing that we are deservant of eternal death, coming to Christ on the cross, we are forgiven. And in the grace of his forgiveness, we can forgive others. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, 
even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Now notice, the reason we can forgive is because we have been forgiven. We forgive not because the other person is worthy of our forgiveness, but because Christ has forgiven us. So we have the capacity to forgive. We recognize, don't miss this, we recognize that our failure to forgive leaves a scar on our own souls. Bitterness, resentment, and a lack of forgiveness poisons the stream of our own lives. We forgive not simply because the other person is worthy of it, but because it's the right thing to do. We forgive another when we release them from our condemnation because Christ has released us from his condemnation. We no longer accuse them because we are no longer accused by Christ. President Abraham Lincoln was one of the most large-hearted, forgiving presidents in American history. And he had a political rival by the name of Edwin Stanton. Now, Stanton and Lincoln would often debate in the run-up of the presidency. And uh, Stanton called Lincoln the original gorilla. He said, you see that man over there? He's the original gorilla. And he would really uh, taunt Lincoln, try to get him into an a argumentative debate. When Lincoln was elected president, he chose Stanton to be his Secretary of War, one of the top political officials in America. When, when, when Lincoln was asked, why'd you do that? He said, it's the best man qualified for the job. And so he's, he's qualified for it, so I, I'm not going to keep him from that. When Lincoln died, Stanton gave a speech, and he said this, there lies the most perfect ruler of men the world has ever seen. We can be at peace knowing that we are forgiven and we are forgiving. We can be at peace only. You're never going to have peace if you don't know you're forgiven by God. You're never going to be at peace if those accusing voices keep coming in your head. You're never going to be at peace if you feel constantly condemned for something you've done. But it's only as you kneel before God and ask for forgiveness that there is no condemnation that are in, for those that are in, right, in Christ Jesus. But also, I'll tell you something else. You're never going to be at peace even if you hold a little bit of resentment in your heart for somebody else. Because that is going to poison the springs of your life. The only way to deal with that is say, God, you have forgiven me. Therefore, I can forgive our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Now that last one's an interesting one, isn't it? Is God going to lead you into temptation? Why would you pray, lead us not into temptation? The word temptation in the New Testament is also used as testing. Now, when we think of the word temptation, we think of an enticement to evil. But the word temptation used in the New Testament is testing, because God's never going to entice you to evil. John, James, take your Bible over to James. We need to settle this one. See, this is more of a promise. James 1, verse 13. James 1, verse 13. Notice what Scripture says. In James, the first chapter, the 13th verse. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So does God lead us into temptation? Yes or no? What does Scripture say? Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Now, we get some help in understanding the biblical meaning of temptation when we go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Matthew 4, verse 1. We get some meaning of what God is talking about. Matthew 4, verse 1. Notice what it says. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do you think the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness so he would be enticed to do evil? Not at all. So a much better translation would be, then was Jesus led up into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested, to be tested. See, God longs to develop our characters. I love what this statement says in the book 
Thoughts to the Mount of Blessings, page 117. And you can notice it here. Thoughts to the Mount of Blessing, page 117. God in his great love is seeking to develop in us the graces of his spirit. What is God seeking to do in your life? Develop the graces of his spirit. He permits us to encounter obstacles. So what's God going to allow you to encounter this week? What are you going to encounter this week? Obstacles. Don't you throw up your hand and say, oh God, why are you doing this? No, he has a purpose. Persecution and hardship, not as a curse. So when the obstacles come, the persecution comes, the hardship comes, not as a curse, but as the greatest blessing of our lives. Wow, that means that the obstacles I face, the persecution I face, the hardship I face isn't a curse, but it can be the greatest blessing. Every temptation resisted, every trial or test bravely borne gives us a new experience and advances us in the work of character building. So when we pray, Lord, lead us not into testing or temptation. What we're really praying is, God, you have promised that I would not be tested above what I'm able, and I'm claiming that promise. And through this experience that I am going through, I know that you're going to strengthen my faith. I know that as I commit myself to you, that I have the assurance that you will not allow me to be tested above what I'm able. I know that you're going to hold my hand and never let me go. I believe that you love me and that in your incalculable love I am secure. All the demons in hell cannot wrestle you out of the hand of Jesus Christ. Now consider these three requests carefully. When we ask for bread to sustain our earthly lives, we immediately think of God the Father, our Creator, the sustainer of all life. When we ask God for forgiveness, we immediately think of Jesus, God the Son, the Savior, the Redeemer. When we ask for strength to meet life's trials and tests, we immediately think of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Strengthener, the Illuminator, the Guide of the Way. And notice how the prayer ends. Say the prayer with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's Prayer ends with the glorious refrain, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We are in a war in the universe. There's a cosmic struggle between the force of good and evil. This is the final battle, and in this final battle for the throne, Satan desires to rule in God's kingdom. He desires the power that only belongs to Christ. He desires the glory that only belongs to Christ. And the Lord's prayer ends with the assurance, the absolute confidence, the rock-solid promise that the kingdom and the power and the glory belong to Christ and Christ alone. And one day, the whole universe will sing, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and riches and power and honor forever. The Lord's Prayer is not simply a prayer to be said. It is a life to be lived. Jesus encourages us to live a life with absolute confidence in God as our all-loving, all-powerful Heavenly Father. Jesus encourages us to live a life in which we hallow his name, that we honor his character, that we never soil his reputation. Jesus encourages us to live a life focused on his kingdom, to live a life as if we believe that the kingdom is coming and to have our daily activities focused on the kingdom. Jesus encourages us to live a life trusting daily that he'll supply our needs. Jesus encourages us to live a life of forgiveness for all those that have wronged us. Because we are forgiven, we can be forgiving. Jesus encourages us to live a life believing his promise, that he will strengthen us for every trial, give us victory in every temptation. Jesus encourages us to live a life in which day by day and moment by moment we sing, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, I invite you 
into the life of the living Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are a loving heavenly Father who holds us in your hand. You are sovereign. Your love is immense. Your power is supreme. Teach us to honor your name, to never soil your reputation, to never disappoint you. Teach us, Father, to be in the center of your will, to constantly live with the kingdom of Christ reigning in our hearts because we long for you to reign in the universe. Teach us to trust you daily to meet our needs. May we have the large-heartedness to forgive those who've wronged us. Help us never be poisoned by bitterness or resentment. And Lord, help us trust you in the trials and temptations of life so that one day we can sing with all the universe glory and honor and praise to him when the controversy is over and the conflict is ended and one pulse of harmony and gladness beat through the universe. God is love. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.